Well, hello there, beautiful. It's Kylie Patchett here. and Welcome to the world and finally fecking free podcast. I deeply believe that the years during and beyond perimenopause are a rite of passage. All of a sudden, we find ourselves on the precipice of a life transition where our brain literally rewires and runs out of fucks to give. We find ourselves shifting identity, no longer caring what other people think, and being invited to expand into new ways of being. Here, we share the real and raw stories from women who have been through deep midlife metamorphosis, taken a leap of faith, or broken the ties that bind us in patterns of staying small, stuck, and like our needs just don't matter. This is the midlife medicine you didn't even know you needed. Stories full of joy, despair, freedom, courage, and deep self-honoring. I am so glad you found us. Welcome. another edition of the wild and fucking finally free podcast I just said that back to front but anyway whatever (laughs) I'm Kylie today I'm talking to the beautiful Angelique Clark I'm really excited about this episode because it's another one of our healer and helper episodes so Angelique I'm going to read her professional bio bio, which is going to take me a couple minutes uh, and then we'll get started so Angelique is an advanced accredited sports nutrition uh, sorry dietitian a female lifestyle performance nutritionist this is my favorite bit, a nourisher to active perimenopausal women, Woo-hoo! an exercise physiologist, a level one anthropometrist, I can never say that word, <laughs> speaker and corporate presenter, founder, director, and educator of Finding Your Wings, which is an online female foundation nutrition course, which I'm currently in. Welcome to the podcast, Angelique. How are you? Harley, thank you so much. <laughs> I always let you to do that introduction because it is mouthful, but I think it's nice to get the formalities out of the way. It is, it is. I'm so excited to be opening up. Like I was posting on social media before a couple of days ago. I'm like, we're opening up a can of worms because when I invited you on the show and I said, what would you like to introduce as a status quo challenge in your interview in terms of the bullshit that we all buy into and you straight away said I want to tell the story of why I want to do nutrition my way so let's start there tell me more <laughs> oh look I mean it's been a, an absolute journey like everything and I think probably like every one of your guests that have come before me it's it started probably in my fascination with how to change the female body in terms of physique so it did start on the external and as always it ends up being internal Mm -hmm. Um, and what we learn over the course of that time frame was so much more than what I bargained for so I did have my first love came with exercise science I come from uh, you know a very a a sporting background as such my dad was a French cyclist my mum while she wasn't as sporty she was very much um, I would say alternative she was doing meditation before I knew what the hell that was Um, and always had this beautiful uh, respect and foundation for food, of course, coming from a European background. Mm. So I guess my interest got sparked with how exercise and movement made me feel because I felt like it was a metaphor for life. It was empowerment. It was Mm. um, giving me a sense of accomplishment as well. And I don't think you know, something hard. And we always say, look, exercise, it's maybe not necessarily fun when you're doing it, but we never regret it afterwards. And I think that's entirely true about most things in life. So I fell in love with exercise first. And then I became fascinated with the nutrition aspect of things because I thought, you know, you can train as much as what you want, but what are we nourishing ourselves with and how can we get a better performance? And that has always been my intention with exercise. It was never about weight loss. And so when I went into dietetics, everyone was so heavily focused on weight loss you know I was obsessed in obsessed was- let's just be honest obsessed with weight loss our entire ah. society obsessed with weight loss <laughs> and they still are like I yeah. think it's you know I'm here to change the culture we're here to change that narrative but mm. this is where it started from and I think having that intention that isn't solely focused on weight loss is really what I'm about and I think when I developed finding your wings after years of working for others, for weight loss centers, Mm. for, you know, other businesses, I finally got to the stage where I was like, no, I need to do things my way. And, you know, Nutrition to Soar is really, um, it's an expression of who I am wholly, absolutely wholly. I think for me, I always start these interviews offline and then go, oh, we need to press record because this is actually what we want to talk about. For me, when I found you, so I found you through Sonia Lovell, the beautiful Sonia Lovell from Dear Menopause. Shout out to anyone who hasn't connected with that show. You have to do, if you are perimenopausal or menopausal, you need to be listening to that woman. And I heard Angelique and I was like, oh my God, this is the person that could well be able to help me. Got on the phone, 
to you and shared my long <laughs> history of dieting, crash cycling, you know, losing 30 kilos, putting 35 back on, et cetera, et cetera, for my entire life. So obsessed with the external, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and also lots of conditioning around using food to soothe, et cetera. And being in your program at the moment, the greatest gift of oh, so many gifts, but I'm just going to share from a empowerment, like those two words when you say about exercise being empowerment and accomplishment, I feel so much better in myself knowing how to fuel the type of exercise that I like doing because I really, 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 really love lifting weights and doing really challenging yoga. That's my jam. They're my two favorite types of movement. But what I'm noticing is that after restricting myself in these stupid unsustainable diet programs, your program, I'm actually learning how to fuel the type of movement that I want to do. Can you tell me a bit more? You said something before we started recording about when women are not fueling the exercise, then it's contributing to us taking up less space and being smaller. Let's go down that track because I'm fascinated by this point of view. (sighs) Yeah, look, I mean, it's a societal message that's been bombarded for years and years. And I think Mm. no matter what platform you look at, obviously we've got, you know, social media nowadays, which make it really more prevalent. But back when I was sort of growing up, it was Dolly magazines, it was Cleo magazines, it was all those types of magazines where we would look for inspiration of how to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And I think the only one that really made me change my mindset about that was the Oxygen magazine. And there was a bit of flaw in that as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. At least they had muscles. Look, and, and that's exactly right. And for those that don't know what I'm talking about, Oxygen Magazine was a female basically exercise magazine where women would be getting on the front cover and they'd be looking fit and athletic. And I mm. thought, wow, gosh, isn't that so empowering rather than just being thin? And is our only measure of worth or success being thin in life? Mm. And, and I think that was just, you know, that was the key. That was a catalyst where I went, no, there's something different here. And I, so I was 17, my last day of high school, I walked into the female only gym in Cairns, really small town up in North Queensland and I asked to put on muscle and the trainers almost fell over backwards Um, and I was just absolutely enthralled by I guess like I said that sense of accomplishment about being strong and being a strong female leader in that space so that's kind of the where it started from that aspect and then as I went through as I was involved in the fitness industry for many many years we've owned a numerous number amount of gyms I've seen the culture in the diet space but also in the fitness space and they're very very similar so they're perpetually trying to get women to become smaller or leaner Um, no matter which angle you're looking from it's about pulling food out not putting food in Um, and unfortunately that message has then been equal to that's how you improve your health and the two couldn't be further apart so there needs to be a shift and a shift in focus of what we're trying to achieve because without Mm. your health you cannot be the fittest, the strongest, the leanest that you can be anyway. And that's what I discovered as I went into physique sculpting. I've worked a lot with physique management sports as a sports dietitian. Mm-hmm. seen women get very, very lean. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can tell you they're the furthest away from health they've ever been. So yeah, there is a big point. And I think that's really what we need to discern with women is that being smaller also means that you're stopping yourself on multiple aspects of life. And when I created the concept of nourishing a high performing lifestyle, it wasn't just about what we were doing in the gym or what we were trying to achieve from a physique perspective. It was more about How can I make my vehicle, this wonderful, beautiful gift of a body I have to actually go forth and do what we're meant to do, which is our purpose. You know, we're so much more productive than just trying to fit into a size six dress. Yeah. Amen. Oh my God. This is music to my ears. I also, the thing that's standing out the most to me is this, there's so many flawed concepts in the diet industry. It's like smaller automatically equals better. And we were just on a coaching call the other night and you talked about smaller um, being tied to I must be worthier. And I'm just like, if we could scrub that out and just say, how about we change the um, the intention to nourishing so that we feel our best, like feel our best, not look our best. And also actually, so I'm really interested to understand because I didn't realize your dad was a French cyclist. That kind of makes sense in the picture when I didn't realize that you had a French, you know, heritage background. And to me, when I think about um, at least the stereotype of how I understand the French approach to food is that um, food is for pleasure. It's not there for overindulgence, but it is there as a tool of connection and celebration and 
it's a very different way to how we look at food. I, that, that's my understanding. I've never even been to France, so this is totally me, <laughs> you know. But do you think that that's coloured your relationship with food and fueling yourself? Oh, look, it absolutely has. And, and sometimes, you know, we're not too <laughs> forthcoming in saying thank you to our parents, but I think if there's a moment in time where you do want to go back and thank them, um, yes. this would be it because it really did. I, I never realised that, you know, of course you just grow up in the household that you're given, yeah, right? Yes. And, and yeah. I had no idea that, I was a little bit different to everybody else. And mm-hmm. uh, we just had a really beautiful respect for food. I was fortunate enough mm. to spend some years growing up in France. So I went to mm. through the schooling system then. You know, we would go home for lunch. It was the highlight of my day. Mm. And my mum always says, you were born at 6 p.m. and just in time for dinner. Um, you know, <laughs> so I, I'd always <laughs> just had this love, love it. of food. Um, and, and, you know, my mom, I grew up watching my mum in the kitchen and there was so much, you know, home cooking that I just yes. kind of yes. took for granted really and mm. really I was the only kid having you know wholemeal sandwiches with camembert in them at school and that was a bit different when I moved to Cairns um, <laughs> you know I was looked at a little bit differently um, but it was also normalized because my dad was a cyclist that activity was just a normal part of the day as well so yes. you know my dad would get up early he'd go out training um, and he'd come back and then you know as I got older I would go out with him and mm. the best part of my day was actually eating after exercise mm. and you know and I think about the wonderful benefit of post-training fuel and, and you know yes. looking at the science behind that as a practitioner and I just absolutely I didn't know it before I was doing it but um, it was nice to add the science and learn the science around that yeah. after I lived it as well so yeah there's multiple ways and, and um, benefits of how I guess that European influence has come through but mm. purely it was whole foods first um, we always ate from the garden um, my parents still have a wonderful absolutely fantastic garden that I steal mm-hmm. from now mm-hmm. um, and it was home cooking and I think we've lost the art of that and there is definitely an art to it but there's also love that goes in and passion that goes into cooking for pleasure but also for supporting others in a beautiful social environment so it also brings people together so there's connection there there's nutrition but there's also enjoyment and I think that's the key the missing element is that anyone that's been on a diet of any description I mean how joyful is that you know we just we lose it yeah and it's it's not a way to live at all no, it's not a way to live. And it's also not a way to, I don't, I'm comparing my upbringing around food. My upbringing around food was um, only eat good food. And then I also watched one of my parents, like every time there was a tricky emotion, then eat like two packs of mint sliced biscuits. So, so that was, and I grew up thinking that was normal. And so I recreated that and yeah, God forbid, I look back at my two beautiful girls who are now 17 and 18 and I think, oh God, how much damage did I do with all my dieting? And, you know, you know what you know until you know better and all of those things. So compassion. Um, but yeah, turning turning the attention to actually fueling yourself has been such a, yeah, I, I actually I just want to share um, in one of the coaching calls that we just did, we were doing the, you know, calculating macros. And I'm like, Ange, I must have done something wrong here because um, my macros say I should be eating like, and uh, maybe I start start with the trigger warning at the beginning of this episode because I know for some people talking about calories and specifically may well be something that's not helpful. So I will include that, Um, but I will share this. I have come from most recently, very, very super strict cult-like diet where you cut out whole food groups and you eat around about 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day. And I was sharing with you that one of the things that I lost was my ability to exercise the way that I wanted to. So I also lost my feeling of strength and groundedness and power and just, um, you know, that beautiful posture that you get in your body when you're actually moving your body as a functional, beautiful working machine, as it should be. Um, And I fell down the trap of thinking, oh, well, you know, you're in your late 40s, so maybe this is just what age feels like. (sighs) <sighs> so anyway, we're in this coaching call and I say to you, I think I've done this calculation wrong because it says my calories should be 2,400 a day. And you just look at me and go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk let's about that. that because, yeah, you, <laughs> the way that you do, you know, and you, you also have a part of your program, which is fat loss science. So you're still talking about, yes, if you, if your desire is to decrease your fat whilst also fueling your body, that there is a way to do it healthily and sustainably, very different to the 1200 calorie thing. So let's bust some myths here. What are the things that the diet industry will teach us and particularly women in midlife that just don't bloody well work? 
Well, the first thing is they've left you out of the equation. So you've got absolutely no say in the diet itself. Yeah. Mm, so when mm. did that when did that become the rule? You know, it was like this is the twelve to twelve hundred like twelve hundred, a thousand to twelve hundred calorie diet. Mm. This is what you stick to, go forth and do what you need to do. Mm. And in some elements as well, not only coupled with that, particularly in the fitness industry, is they'll sit you on that amount of calories and then just increase your cardio on top yes. of that. So, you know, for me as a sports dietitian, it makes absolutely no sense to do that. The mm-hmm. more active you are, the more fuel that you're going to need to support that activity. Yeah. So I think when you think about it from that aspect, it's completely different. Now, I came from one of my first jobs as working as a dietitian was in a weight loss clinic. I'm not going to name names. No, no. But it was heavily, based on, <laughs> it was heavily based on shake diets. Yeah, okay, um, good. And, and just weight loss. So, you know, we were actually, as an exercise physiologist, because remember, that's my background first yes, before yes. I went into nutrition. Yeah, so yeah. I had this, this beautiful understanding of how your body worked and how movement was so empowering and powerful and the positive benefits of that. And then I walked into this weight loss clinic where the sole focus was, okay, we need to help these people lose weight. And so as an exercise physiologist, one day I would say, hey, guess what? You need to slow down your exercise because we're only giving you a thousand calories Mm. or less and you can't support that training. So I was telling them to stop exercise to Mm. lose weight. Mm. Now that, that right there, it, I had an ethical moment where I went, I'm not doing what my calling is because how can I tell people to slow down and stop training just to lose weight? Didn't make sense to me. So that was my first light bulb. Mm -hmm. Um, And after which going through that, then being in the fitness industry, I've competed as a physique model. I've, you know, I've seen, I've taken women through that sort of journey and that, and that contest preparation, um, you know, and, and to get women that, they call themselves metabolically damaged is because they have literally sat on a chronic deficit for far too long. And what happens in terms of the endocrine system, if we think Mm -hmm. about how our body as a female functions, we start to lose things such as our menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. And that is an optimal sign of health. And that's where I went, hang on a minute, there's something not quite right that's happening here. And that was almost a goalpost marker for them to think that they were lean enough and they were ready for competition. So If you have seen the ramification of really chronic low energy availability, of course, there's so many other factors that happen. That is kind of the tip of the iceberg when we're looking at this. Mm -hmm. There's so many things underlying that is really suppressing your endocrine system, how your body functions. And unfortunately, we just don't see that on the inside. And so Mm -hmm. you're operating at a subpar level across multiple aspects of your life. Um, And these are the sorts of little warning signs and things that I want you to start noticing when you're following these types of diets. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a stage where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't lose any more weight or I'm starting to put on weight now what's going on again it could be the suppression of the endocrine system the whole metabolic rate drops particularly if we're lowering our carbohydrates specifically so women need carbohydrates first and foremost we also need to change our relationship with carbs as we get older but that's based on our physiology and Mm -hmm. I always say if you treat yourself like that in your younger more reproductive years Mm -hmm. by the time you get to perimenopause and menopause Do you expect your body to jump up and down and say, thanks very much for treating me like that? Uh, No. No. And this is the really beautiful, pristine time in our lives where we kind of take a little bit of an inventory and we start to reflect on some of the behaviors that we've done up until this moment. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I have battled my whole life to change that narrative and that culture in the industry. I've managed Mm. to do it in my gyms, the gyms that we own very well. I can't change the world, Um, you know, unfortunately. And I, I love Michelle Bridges when she came out, but unfortunately, The Biggest Loser was a really terrible uh, concept for most people and they latched onto it and then that's what they expected when they came to see me as a practitioner. So there's a lot of things that we have to unravel, some myths that we have to bust because, of course, and you tell me, like, how do you go on following a diet like that? Is it successful? Long-term, it isn't. So there's a short-term fix. We cannot do that. We can't expect that we're going to be functioning optimally Mm -hmm. if, A, our menstrual cycle is not in a beautiful natural hormonal cycle um, and B, we're not actually fronting up to life with as much energy, zest, enthusiasm as what we would if we were actually fueled properly. Yeah, there's no juice in life. And my experience, certainly with the the no, no, absolutely no sugar, no forms of sugar, no fruit, no flour, was I wasn't actually sleeping. Like, because I'm like, <laughs> and I wasn't thinking clearly and I couldn't fuel my exercise and I was not as, naturally um even tempered as what I would be when I'm feeling myself and to me I'm like is this the way that I want my life to feel uh, no <laughs> I do not want to turn up like this and I love the way that you say front up to life because it's like yeah how this is not just about how I look it's about how I feel and therefore how my relationships are how my sleep is how my you know and 
And to me, one of the key things was if I don't intervene in these perimenopause years, which is, I really strongly believe this natural time where we, like you say, start asking ourselves some high quality questions. What am I available for? What am I not available for? At the beginning of this year, my promise to myself was no more diets ever in my life, ever, ever, ever. Because I was like, I'm just not available for feeling like I'm either on a diet and being good and I'm air quoting or off a diet and being bad. And to me, the bad end of things just ended up being, you know, overeating my way back to exactly where my body started because I was doing it unsustainably. So it's like, it's not working. Stop doing it. (laughs) Um, When you think about other magic fixes, like, you know, without naming the shake diet industry end of things. What are we actually doing when we slow our metabolism down as as a result of that? What are some of the things that can turn up in perimenopause years as a result of that damage that we've actually done? Yeah, probably the the biggest thing is is, uh, taking the same concept of what didn't work and then expecting Mm -hmm. it to work again when your whole landscape has changed hormonally. Mm -hmm. So we're so ingrained in this pattern of action that, oh, my gosh, you know, and and we know physiologically we've got the evidence to support that. The research is there and very clear that perimenopausal women will actually suffer from an increase in what we term visceral abdominal fat, so just Mm -hmm. belly fat gain. Um, I hate this term, but some people say menopot. So that, you know, midsection increase, yes. So we start to notice the change of how we hold and distribute body fat Mm -hmm. is going to gravitate a little bit more upwards into our midsection. That then starts the... uh, the risk factor of increasing in things such as insulin resistance, maybe it's looking at type 2 diabetes. Our cholesterol markers are actually um, go unfavorably as well. We also see some depressive mood states and things like that because as we start to age, estrogen starts to decline and so Mm -hmm. too maybe does progesterone if we're getting more anovulatory cycles as our our cycle and our eggs are starting to dry up a little bit and shut shop. So this is the whole thing that we need to realize is that now the hormonal landscape has changed, but we're still trying to do the stuff that we did back in our 20s and 30s and it ain't working again. But the only message we've been given is to eat less because we're putting on weight Mm. and exercise more. Mm. And I think particularly around, you know, big birthdays, like 40s, Mm. 50s, like Mm -hmm. I see women come into my clinic and go, I want to sign up and do a marathon. And I was like, oh, great. Like, do you love running? Like, you know, what was the the intention behind that? They go, no, I absolutely hate running. And I was like, why are you doing it? So I've got a reason to lose weight for my 40th. And and so these are the other things that, you know, the intention needs to start changing. And so by doing that, eating less, exercising more, um, Mm. and they've often done that before they've gotten to me, I'm the end point. I'm the (laughs) Yeah, yeah, not the beginning, unfortunately. I'm unfortunately not the beginning. And Mm. and sometimes I kind of go, well, you kind of need to do that to realize, you know, the hard way that it's not going to work for you favorably long term. Um, But, you know, doing that is going to actually further exacerbate the problems. And then along with that is the whole host of emotion and the guilt that's associated with that about the fear of failing and constantly Mm. perpetuating that belief, that story that, you know, we're not good enough and we can't do anything and it doesn't work Mm. anyway. So why do we even try and why do Mm. we even bother? So, yeah, that's the tricky part, and I think that's probably the most detrimental part when, in actual fact, we should see this as a beautiful, opportune time to start nourishing what we do know is going to help those situations from a physical standpoint to actually age better. So we want to make sure that you're functional as you get older so you're not going to fall over and break a hip. Mm. Um, You know, we want to make sure that we are looking at clearing that blood glucose because we don't want to get insulin resistant because that's going to contribute to things maybe like type 2 diabetes. Mm. So let's start adding in some activity, but we also need to be fueling that activity Mm. in order for you to be able to perform it from a long time perspective. So yeah, it's not just quick fix, 12 weeks, six week challenge or whatever it is at the gym. Um, That's not going to get you anywhere. It didn't in the past anyway. It's something that you need to look at from a sustainability measure and really factor into your lifestyle. And it becomes more about a value-based change as opposed to I'll just do it for a certain amount of time. Yeah, I love that. And that that is definitely where my head has come to after, you know, my promise to myself because you do get stuck in that. I, I will say own it. I got stuck in the when I was skinnier, I felt, but here's the other thing, and this is something else for people who are listening to really, really ask themselves, am I just losing weight? Because I think that when I'm losing weight and I'm at this particular weight thing that I will then feel better about myself or happier or more, whatever. And I call bullshit. The relationship that you have with how you look and your worth as a base of it is a flawed, like we've been given a conditioned idea 
that this will somehow make us better people or more worthy or more whatever, like fill in the blank. It's like, no, <laughs> your, your alignment to the way that you want to live your life. Same as what you said, you know, when you had that sort of moment where you were like, I'm not actually val- like, I'm not in line with my values. I can't say to people, stop exercising because I know that exercise is one of the fundamental ways that we can take care of ourselves. And yet you were sitting in a clinic telling people not to exercise because it wasn't sustainable. It's like that's that's the sort of questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Like why do you actually automatically want to lose weight? What's the, you know, what what is the end point here? And, and will you be we... happy, you know, because yeah. often you, if you think back then, you probably were always perpetually on a diet anyway. It was never yeah. good enough. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And the three years that I spent in the cult, um, <laughs> I, you know, the concept of never being able to enjoy, I don't like champagne, but, you know, like a celebratory drink, or if my girls got married, never having a piece of wedding cake, like that, you know, that sort of complete, you have to sacrifice everything to stay in this body. And I look back now and I go, I was the unhappiest I was because I was constantly obsessed with what I was going to put in my mouth next. That is not living. You are not free to. Yeah, with that level of obsession and energy and mind space taken up with what you're going to be eating, you're not actually delivering your gifts to the world. You're not connecting with people properly. You're not, you know, like there's no satisfaction in that. So let's just cut that bullshit. Um, one of the other things that I was feeling into as you were talking about, um, you know, aging well, I used to work in aged care just for a couple of years. And one of the key things that I, that really, really settled in for me was that there was 90 plus year olds there still mobile, getting in, enjoying things, dancing at happy hour on a Friday afternoon. And then there was 60 year olds who were so um, debilitated by not always lifestyle driven, but a lot of lifestyle driven factors that, you know, preventable disease states that have unfortunately occurred over decades of making different choices. And I was just like, I do not want to be a 90 year old in a wheelchair, not being able to get around or falling down and breaking a hip because my bone density is so poor. So when we start going into those perimenopause years and our, the endocrine hormonal cascade starts to change, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of making sure that our, you know, our body is functioning well, that, you know, our, our aging is actually done in a healthy way rather than in a debilitation way? Oh, this is a fabulous question. So there are some principles that we know from looking mm-hmm. at the research. Now, of course, um, there's not a lot of research that's done with active perimenopausal women, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. we are changing that landscape a little mm-hmm. bit. Hopefully there's going to be some more funding that's being allocated because, of course, you know, once we hit 40, we immediately disappear apparently. Of course um, we do. Yes, especially if we're women, especially if we have uteruses. Oh, that's exactly right. So we become Uteri? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> plural. What um, is the plural of uterus? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, and I think this is this is a beautiful opportunity, this midlife, you know, like we've got an average age. Women will live longer than men on average. We know that by the research, you know, I yep. think the average age is 84.7 years or something like that. So really we get to 40 and we go, okay, our bodies are now starting to change. How can we embrace that? And what does the research give us at the moment? So we, I did do a bit of a deep dive into that. Yes. I had to find the answers because, of course, my active women that I supported in their reproductive years were now actually getting older as yes. I was as well. <laughs> and I selfishly wanted to know exactly what I needed to do to make sure that I had that functionality long term. And that became, that is really the main reason and drive after me to continue exercising. I don't love exercise. I love how it makes me feel. I love how, what it does for my body and what Mm -hmm. it does for my spirit, but I don't absolutely love it. So I think it's nice to make that point because you don't need to love things just to know to do them that they're good for you sometimes. yeah exactly <laughs> and over time with consistency you actually learn to you, you learn to miss it if it's not always part of your routine yeah absolutely so, yes, definitely and, and so what I learned over the course of that time frame is because estrogen that potent form of e2 estradiol is now starting to decline we're getting a little bit more of a different type of estrogen that's rising in our body um, unfortunately it 
doesn't have the same effect, not only from a muscular perspective and a reproductive perspective, but also systemically across the board on multiple different le- levels and areas. Mm. So we need to start going, okay, well, if estrogen, which we know is anabolic, it helps us to lay down more bone and more muscle. Yes. If that's not going to be present, then what can we counter with the things that we do have control over with our nutrition and exercise to mitigate that loss? And we call this just in general, like I'm talking to obviously perimenopausal women, but aging yes. in general, you are going to lose muscle. It's called yep. sarcopenia. Yep. It just happens as an inevitable decline and it happens past the age of 30 unless you're doing something to attenuate that. We can't stop it, but we can definitely slow it down. Yes. And yes. the way in which we slow it down is we look at high quality, what we call HBV, high biologically valuable proteins, the protein that has all those beautiful building blocks called amino acids that mm-hmm. we can get from our nutrition. We make sure that that's present and available in little drip feeds over the day. Yes. And that's super important, particularly for women. They're a bit scared of protein. They think they're going to become the Hulk as well. <laughs> and, when <I> say, <laughs> and when I say combine that with resistance training, people in their 40s at <laughs> this stage almost fall over backwards because it's not necessarily something in that age bracket that they would have wanted to, to do voluntarily. Mm. They, mm. you know, it's probably culturally the man thing it's something you do if you're an athlete but I'm talking about you as being an everyday athlete and not being able to fall over and break a hip right yeah amen. So we, yeah we need to start doing it and and we don't need to do it from a physique perspective but it will change your physique so it is going to be a byproduct regardless yes. um, it is going to make you functional and it's going to stop that and attenuate that muscle decline so you can remain really active like those 90 year old people that you would see um, dancing around as well and I think you know it's a tipping point when you've got less years in one aspect towards your future than you do behind you you start to look at things a little bit differently but if we could really catch our midlife and go wow I've got another 45 years I'm only in halfway through my life I have so much more to offer Mm -hmm. if I start functioning really really optimally and if we can do that guess what happens as a byproduct we lose weight we change our physique we're happier like these things are going to happen as a byproduct rather than the only focus of why you're doing it. So yes. yeah, that's my my two key factors, I think, from that perspective. Um, the other one, if I can add to it, is mm. fiber because fiber is particularly yes. important when we're looking at gut and brain function. Mm-hmm. It has the ability, now we know, to change our mood state. We understand it's the pinnacle of our immunity. 70% is housed in our, of our immunity is housed in our gut. And so mm-hmm. if we don't have a good functioning gut, unfortunately, we're not going to be the best in terms of health markers moving forward. Nope. So really look at you know that beautiful colorful diet of you know not limiting grains not limiting carbohydrates because they contribute to fiber um having beautiful colorful fruit and vegetables are in there as well and things such as nuts and seeds and legumes so really mm-hmm. having a, a diverse plant-based diet is mm. the best key and then adding the elements of the protein drip fed in there with some resistance training so it really can be that simple it doesn't have to be complicated so i i just want to yeah, compare and contrast. <laughs> 1,200 calories, no exercise, no energy to exercise, cutting out carbohydrates, still eating fruit and veg versus, and this is, you know, my reality, two years apart, versus eating probably twice as many calories, drip feeding protein. Um, I had, oh, my God, I'm so in love with this one recipe in your program. I just tried the tuna, chickpea, olive salad yesterday for lunch I went out to Shane I said this is the best thing I have ever freaking well eaten (laughs) and you know coming from someone who has been scared of carbohydrates for such a long time because of that stupid diet culture you know but also the difference in feeling you know tired and like I'm aging and like I'm not sleeping well versus I literally feel like I'm jumping out of my skin at the moment because I'm training the way I want to I'm sleeping really well I'm eating well And also there's an enormous power in understanding what my body actually needs because to now, you know, I know that's music to your ears because that's your whole point. Until now, my absolutely, my process is to feel better about myself. I need to be a particular size. Therefore, I need to start myself. That's just the way that I've always done it. And of course, never achieved, you know, never achieved that. And I'm like, oh, so actually fueling myself to be the person I want to be and to be able to, I literally feel like I've now got the energy to just glow out into the world. And then, you know, then we're able to do what we're meant to in the world and therefore the world benefits. Like 
this is crazy stuff, Ange. I feel like I know <laughs> Ange's got the biggest smile on her face because I'm like, this is her jam. This is exactly why you do it. Right. You know, and it's funny when I said, you know, I sort of got into this and 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 within my industry, it's it's obviously very scientific. And I love yes. that. Don't get me wrong. I come from having two science degrees. Yep. I appreciate and I respect science. But there's more to food than just the numbers. You know, we don't eat numbers. And Mm -hmm. nutrition science is, it's it's valid and it's valuable, but eating is behavioral. And when we look Mm. at so many other success measures, if we're just focusing on the tangible, what's my scale weight telling me? And that's the only measure of success. You start to lose all the other wonderful things that you, A, can be grateful for, um, Mm. and B, you've just missed out on knowing that that's your contribution to the world. So for me, nutrition is as much a scientific as it is a spiritual spiritual journey. And as much as, you know, I said my mum was a little bit alternative and, you know, I remember walking in and going, can you take me to basketball? And she'd be sitting there meditating. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? (laughs) I had no idea. She was very much into Tai Chi, Buddhism. Uh, reflexology or oh, so I, like, I was like oh I was like mom you're crazy like give me science any day and I am naturally inclined to understand so much more and we know that that science in terms of frequency energy what we create yes. and all these types of things now we've got the science to help that but mm. in my mind growing up I was like oh I need to do the science element because it's all about just what you eat and how you exercise yes. and that's how you get healthy and that's how you change No, I mean, we've looked at research that says what makes people live the longest. And there was a Harvard study that was looked at that longevity study. And at the end of that, it wasn't your cholesterol levels that made you live the longest. It was the relationships that you had with people. And so, you know, when we look at these things, it's food and exercise. It's just one component. It's an amazing component and I love it. And I think we're doing it wrong in the fitness and the diet industry, which is what I'm going to change. But don't don't ever discredit, you know, your journey and and the pathway that's going to become of that because we're just really keeping this bag of bones uh, well enough to actually live out what what our purpose is here Mm. in terms of contributing for the time that we've got on this planet. So, you know, it it became a, a... one of my major underlying passions, which I was very scared to talk about because in my, within my colleagues, you know, if I start talking about this woo-woo stuff, they're like, what are you talking about? You don't have any evidence of that. Just shush. That doesn't make any sense or difference to what we're trying to achieve. And I have to say as a Mm. practitioner, it's probably the biggest success marker of my clinical practice is my, my main goal is to make somebody walk out of the room that they've been in with me and make them feel better about themselves and when they walked in because if I can do that then I've done my job I don't really care what they eat after that (laughs) yeah absolutely yep yep actually um on a similar note actually a couple of things first of all my brain is skittering towards something I saw I can't remember whose post it was on Instagram but there was he and his wife were in Italy and they had this beautiful glasses of red wine and this gorgeous plate and he was talking about yeah the longevity end of things and he's like here's my lessons from my time in Italy. You know, um, you take every day to be outside in the sunshine, either you work your land or you walk five kilometers a day. You make sure that you connect with your friends at every mealtime. You eat with love. You eat enough to feel full and nothing more. Um, I can't remember any other things, but I'm getting goosebumps. Is that, that's like, is that not a way better way of approaching life um, and longevity? than starving ourselves and trying to. And then the second thing is um, one of the the things that you got us to do early on in the program was to think about, um, like for me, Kylie 2.0. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because that that's very in alignment to what you were just yeah, discussing. Yeah. And and again, this is me being that non-traditional scientific dietitian. Um, that I love it. First and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a scientist by training, right? And I'm Totally woo-woo. So woo-woo and science that's, right along with your love. We <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, and and this is what I get. I get my ladies to do, whether they're a one-on-one client with me, we delve into that obviously in a little bit more detail, whether yes, you're in my group yes. program, obviously I get you to, here's the homework, you go and do it mm-hmm. on your own bat. Um, but my biggest thing, and it's part of the self-sabotage module, is really looking yes. at the internalized dialogue that we tell ourselves because mm-hmm. that, of course, creates our belief system and our belief system will actually dictate all the actions that we do, whether it's food related. And obviously I talk to food, so I kind of skew it that way. Yes. Um, but that's just how we front out with most of the things that we do 
in life. And so we're either supporting that narrative or we're not. And I think having taken inventory over that conscious awareness of going, hang on a minute, how is it that I speak to myself? Do I beat myself up every morning when I look at myself in the mirror, when I jump on those scales? Do I talk to myself like a failure? And of course, if you are doing that, then of course, that's what you're going to get. So, you know, we go where our attention is. And so Mm -hmm. for a long time, so many women that would come through my clinic, the first, or if not the second goal, when I would say, what brought you to here? You know, why did you want to start this nutrition journey? It was at some point weight loss, and that'll come up at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And I will always say, look, if I can remove that as a goal post, what are the other reasons why you want to change your nutrition behaviors? And so that's where I'd probably get somebody to start with. And it's getting them to identify the intention, the real intention. You know, Simon Sinek says, ask why five times. I think that's when you get the real answer of what's actually sitting underneath that. And of course, we know that women, our bundle, it's always bundled food and our food relationship is very much bundled within our Um, self-worth. Our appearance has been told to us for many, many times, you know, oh, you're beautiful. Like think about how you, you talk to little girls, mm. you know, as opposed yes. to how you talk to, to boys. boys. Yes. And, and so it stems from there. And I think, mm. you know, it's a long journey to be able to change the things and what we've been exposed to, but that's not your job. Your job is to be able to identify and recognize it and to be able to know that you've got the choice to choose differently. And what yes. if you were to use that choice, that magical choice, I don't, I talk about, there's no magical unicorns when it comes to supplements and, um, you know, magic pills and weight loss pills. Um, But there is a magical choice that you can have and that you can make. And that's having the decision and knowing that you've got the decision to take a different pathway. Mm -hmm. And if you were to take that different pathway, what would that end point look like? Mm -hmm. Because so many of us never actually work from the end in mind Mm -hmm. and go, okay, well, what are the characteristics I'm going to need to embody to be that version 2.0 of myself? A, I don't even know what that looks like. And B, how do I even describe that? Well, if you have no idea, then unfortunately you're never going to be that person. No, exactly. So that's what I get women to do first and foremost and at the start right. of the journey before we even talk about food, okay? It's really yeah. looking at these types of values and going, well, where does my value lie? Am I being congruent with that? And if there's a little bit of irritation, a bit of frustration, I say, well, let's just you know, be open and accepting and hold space for what comes up there. Mm. And how would you like that to be different? Because, of course, we do get that choice. So, yeah, it's just about redirecting those thoughts and realizing that we're not our thoughts solely. We're the thinker behind that. And so if we can create that sort of powerful connection, then what we do is entirely internal will reflect the external every single time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I loved that exercise because it was I'm very, very passionate. Obviously, the work I do in the world is that, you know, my key belief is you are the decider and you are the creator of your life. We have been taught differently, but when a woman takes a seat, I always say take a seat at the mother trucking table of your life, your reality, your relationships, your relationship with food, your whatever. Um, I know I really must stop swearing, but that's kind of just the way I'm rolling at the moment. I feel very passionate about this. But um, to me, one of the things that um, I've been very consciously painting myself a vision of what life feels like when I gave myself permission to leave my job again and, you know, go back into coaching the way that I wanted my everyday life to feel and also the way I wanted to feel when I woke up. And so that doing that at the beginning of your program just neatly dovetailed into it because I was like, one of my key desires is to feel completely at ease in my body, to feel vital, to feel inspired, to deliver my gift to the world And a key part of that was actually having the time and the devotion to my own needs, Mm -hmm. you know, actually knowing what it takes for Kylie to feel, you know, happy, healthy, whole. And a key bit of that is moving my body in ways that I really enjoy and, and challenging my body. And now your crazy idea of fueling my body edge like this, (laughs) but yeah, it's like, what do I, how do I want to feel every day? And how do I need to behave to align myself to that vision, that reality? And there's, for me, there was a lot of things in the way because one of my big condition stories is you've got to, you know, work comes first and you've got to work really hard and da, 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 da. And it's like at the expense of your self care, at the expense of your nourishment, at the expense of, and I'm like, nope, not my story anymore. Um, so yeah, the choice and the Kylie 2.0 and I put up a picture in our group that Kylie 2.0 is definitely someone who rides a bike regularly for joy, (laughs) rides a bike very regularly for joy. Um, 
Yeah, because that feeling of freedom and being lit up doing something that's for fun and connecting to my beautiful husband who, you know, we're, we're empty nesters this week. Got one at schoolies and one that's left home. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's crazy, crazy, crazy. I don't know what to do. And life life changes. And that's the other thing with nutrition. Like I have clients that have seen me 10 years ago versus Mm -hmm. now and they've come back in and they almost feel like, oh, why do I need to see you again? I'm like, well, because your whole entire life's changed. Like either your kids have grown up or you've had a kid or, you know, you've moved to different locations, you've changed your job. So there's so many other environmental changes that we need to consider when we're talking about about nutrition and how that rolls hand in hand so it's no failure to want to look at and revisit nutrition at Mm. every life stage and I think it's a wonderful way to do it taking inventory what does that version 2.0 look like yes because if you get lost along the way which inevitably we probably will take the little garden path down that pathway and then we've got to get ourselves back but the quicker we get ourselves back to that version 2.0 is really what I'm looking for and so the 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 more rerouting that we can do even though your brain's going to want to tell you to take you down that big highway of that belief system that's been ingrained for a long time we can choose to then you know step off the highway and and that's exactly what I mean about making sure you've got the time and the space to create in your mind, visualise in your mind what that actually would look like. Because yeah. for a lot of women, like we said, you know, they get to this point where they're like, I just want to fit into a size six dress and you get there. And like, I've been at the tipping point, I've competed, it's on stage, I've been the leanest and the, um, you know, the most muscular I've ever mm-hmm. been. And mm-hmm. I was far from happy. And if we're chasing happiness for that, it ain't going to happen. You're not going to find it there. So it's an inward game. It's not something that's going to be, it's it's always going to be reflected in terms of the exterior, but it, don't, don't forget the purpose of the journey. And if we start to enjoy that journey, that, that is nutrition success in my yeah. eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, my final thing that I wanted to touch on, you've just reminded me that this is something that I really wanted to bring home to our listeners is can we please have a discussion about the way that we treat weight loss in our society in terms of and we talked about this just recently oh my god you're looking amazing you must have lost weight let's open up that can of worms because if more people are aware of the damage that that could be doing maybe we will might change the dialogue around it Yeah, well, it just reconfirms the stigma and the bias that's associated with fitness equals success and Mm -hmm. that it's celebrated Mm -hmm. and validated. And if we're going to continue to contribute to that, Mm -hmm. what I probably want you to do is just take a moment and and really reflect on the words because words are powerful. Mm -hmm. They come from you. They come, they generate an energy. And so the words that we're choosing to, you know, describe somebody, to say something, to offer Mm -hmm. somebody something um, is really important. And I think for a lot of times when we see, you know, somebody that has maybe lost weight or somebody that's maybe put on weight, what is the difference in dialogue that we choose to express ourselves with Mm -hmm. to that person? And I always say, you don't know anybody's journey underlying that. When I look at disordered eating, and I've worked with a lot of eating disorders as well over the course of my career, that comes, it's not a stereotypical uh, look of any sort of description. So you never know what somebody's going through underneath Mm -hmm. anything that they've done to change their outer physique. And so for some people, you need to be really empathetic and respectful of that, but it could be, again, triggering for them, just the, Mm -hmm. the words in which you choose to have a conversation with them about. So could we, you know, fun fact, is it possible? <laughs> invitation is it time. Possible? It's an invitation <laughs> to choose words that are to do with maybe effort rather than mm-hmm. appearance yeah. to yeah. describe or to say hello to somebody. And I always refer back to, you know, if you were sitting at your funeral and somebody would describe who you are, like your best friend would get up and actually say, you know, this is the story of your life journey. Would they start with, she looked amazing in every single item of clothing that she yes. ever wore. I'm pretty sure that's probably not going to be high for most people in terms of how they value you and their relationship Mm. with you. So how could you be enhancing somebody else's relationship with you? um, And what could Mm. you be doing to empower them to be able to to have another value other than what their appearance looks like? And Mm. don't get me wrong, like if I do love, you know, a certain dress or a certain, um, you know, I, I guess we're not, we're not shy of loving fashion and clothes and things like that I I take a lot of pleasure in that but could we suggest you know that color works really nicely with you or you know something other than how it fits or something to do with that physical body you know maybe we can change that culture and we can change a whole generation of girls growing up now and boys Mm. also Mm, (laughs) you know talking to women and talking to girls and having this 
this idea of what they should look like and, mm. and what they should be in terms of that properness. So, yeah, I think we need to focus more on effort, more on um, how they can act and how they are being as a person rather than what their appearance is or what they look like. Yeah, yeah. I um, I think that it was really interesting for me for our group to share their experiences in terms of, you know, particularly in my journey, the smallest I was, was the most disordered. So my mind was the least healthy that it has ever been to maintain that. So when you get that external, like, oh my God, you look amazing. It's just saying, oh, okay. I have to actually damage myself internally to actually get that validation. It's a really, really dangerous thing. And I think coming back to what you were saying before about how we talk to girls versus how we talk to boys, like my skin crawls every time I see on social media or hear a conversation, oh my God, she looks so pretty in that dress. And I'm like, oh my God, she is a human being. Her value is not how she looks in something. Please, can we stop that at the very beginning? Um, And I'm also laughing because the other day I did (laughs) did some um, groceries and I ended up chasing them. (laughs) Chasing a woman it. down just to tell her because she had she had these like really short hair and spiked up at the top and it was hot pink and I'm like I just have to tell you your hair looks amazing and I thought oh my god she probably thinks this crazy lady but I was just like it just gave me such joy to see someone express like the you know funky I don't know like it just it just gave me joy so I had to tell her and then I was thinking oh god Kylie sometimes. <laughs> Them. No, and you know what? Let that flow because at some yeah. point she needed to hear that too. You know, she actually turned around and said, "I have had the shittiest day. Thank you so much for taking the time to tell me that." And I was like, "Amen. Pass it on." <laughs> That's exactly right. Let and then imagine run. what sort of wave of culture change that we could create by just you know yeah. using our words wisely and just having that space to think. Well, how can I empower that person rather than how can I deflate yes. them by so many other levels? Because we get enough of that with society and the bombardment of the messages that are coming anyway. We can't stop that Um, but you know it's how we choose to then express ourselves and to to be able to enhance somebody else's life is just such a beautiful powerful position and we all have that gift yeah we all have it exactly exactly oh my goodness all right let's um tie this beautiful chat together with a little bit of a summary of what the group program and one-on-one options you have because one something that we didn't touch on I guess I will just tell a very quick story about when I started going through my first um, indication of perimenopause, I shared on this podcast before, I turned into a crying, raging mess in the second half of my cycle. And I was reading, it's a hormone repair manual, isn't it? By Laura yeah. Biden. Yeah. yeah. Lara Biden. Yep. Lara, yeah, yeah, yeah. Close. Yeah. Hormone like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and one we'll of the put things. We'll the link in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, right? We will put the correct author in the show notes. Um, one of the things that she had suggested was if that was part of your symptoms that you could try progesterone in the second half of your cycle. So that's what I went to my doctor and that's what I'm very like, I don't ask the doctor, I say, this is what I'd like. Thank you very much. Um, my beautiful doctor, who's also a middle-aged lady said, sure, go, go ahead. Um, so I've been using that for about six months with good effect, um, helped me sleep, etc. One of the things that you discussed though, in the perimenopause part of the program was, um, a protocol that you would recommend, which is supplementation. We won't go into the details because I know this is not, you know, advice giving interview. Um, but in three supplements, I've been using that for the last cycle that I've had and not use the progesterone and been completely even tempered. So I just want to, I guess, from my personal experience, invite people that are listening. If you are struggling with the symptoms of perimenopause and you have an inkling that perhaps your nutrition may not be fueling the changes in your body um, to check out what Angie's just about to talk about. So go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the first part is exactly what you said, Kylie, is, it, you know, are you fueling yourself correctly? Because often when we go on a thousand calorie, yeah. 1200 mm. calorie diets, we're just not getting enough food volume to actually support what we term RDIs or recommended dietary intake or allowances for certain micronutrients. So we talk a lot to macros and that's kind of, you know, your protein, your carb, your fats mm. and your total energy. And that's what makes your total energy and what you, you know, get from your food and your fluids and things like that. Mm. Um, and if that's, you know, suboptimal, then of course your micronutrition is going to suffer. And with, and being women, obviously um, with our cycles, with our menstrual cycles, if you're a humanoric woman, so you've got yeah. a normal functioning menstrual cycle. Now, of course, when we hit perimenopause, it starts to become a little bit irregular. That's one of the signs and symptoms, which you've obviously spoken Mm. about um, before. So, you know, knowing that 
A, what's normal for you and then making sure what's not normal. So tracking your menstrual cycle is a really important key factor, first and yes. foremost. Eating enough food in general in total to support mm. your day-to-day functioning, but then on top of that to support your exercise is mm. very important. And then what we look at is we talk to it a bit like um, a couple of layers on top of the cake. So, you know, that's good core foundation is your cake batter. Um, that's what you need to be eating day-to-day, making sure it's all, you know, supporting what you're doing. Mm. The icing on top of the cake is really looking at sports-specific nutrition. So if you're mm. more active, we actually enhance that with what type of activity you're doing. So that's kind of the icing on top of the cake. And then things like supplementation come in, and these are the sprinkles on top of the icing on top of the cake. (laughs) So once we've done the foundations right, and that's why I build everyone up to get to this level, um, you know, because there's no point in doing supplementation first. It's kind of like trying to work with an upside down pyramid. It's just going to topple over. So we can't look for, like I said, the magic unicorns in the pills and the supplements, even though Mm -hmm. the supplement industry will tell you otherwise. Yes, (laughs) please make sure that you take your money. (laughs) <laughs> exactly an unregulated industry um, mm-hmm. but there's some certain micronutrients that we look at particularly with females and and mainly I look at um, things that if you have been either on the pill before as well they will deplete these nutrients mm-hmm. too um, yes, and of course yes. if you're under fueling chronic under fueling of course you're not going to be available to these but in particular women really love women's bodies really love magnesium zinc and omega-3 mm-hmm. um, and so these are the beautiful key components once we can obtain that from our food sources then supplementation on top of that might help with what we call that PMS um, time, that sort of week leading into your your period itself, what would be your menstrual cycle. Um, and of course, sometimes if we don't know when that is, maybe you're on um, uh, IUD, you're on the marina, uh, or you just aren't getting a cycle, maybe you're still on the pill. So these might be a little bit tricky to ascertain, but um, mm-hmm. of course, it's not um, of it's not of any harm if we're going to be looking at these little sprinkles once everything else is sort of rounded out. So yeah, they're definitely important. And I think, you know, they could be game changers, particularly for women, because as we start to go through our cycle, we need to understand that our body is building a uterus lining to support a pregnancy. And whilst you may or may not want to fall pregnant, our body still goes through that functionality. It's just Mm -hmm. part of our reproductive system. And so those nutrients are particularly uh, important when we're looking at the process of that. And that is Mm -hmm. why the difference between men and women is so paramount and it absolutely needs to be there and validated and not dismissed Yes, because far too many of us don't realize that most of the diet and the fitness industry and culture when they're looking at nutrition and exercise are letting you know that that's advice based on male subjects in studies because women were too hard to study. Mm. So it's been extrapolated from there. It's not specific to your physiology and we need to honour and understand our menstrual cycle as the the superpower that we have Mm. that might need a little bit more specific micronutrition and macronutrition as well, depending on where we are in our life stage too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So many, like we are not little men. Let's not treat our bodies like little men. Thank God we're not little men. (laughs) There would be too many males in the know. Um, So where can our beautiful listeners find you and find the program that I'm in or one-on-one options for helping to, yeah, understand how to even lay the foundations at first cake batter end of things because I certainly did not know any of that. Like I, I would think, you know, having been a dieter for my entire life that I would have known, no, no, none of that. Nope. Yeah, nope. I think that's, I mean, that is my point of difference is I like to, to view, treat and educate food differently. And, and mm. I, I love hearing, you know, that you could be on so many diets or, you know, be, you know, so many years of age and still be new to nutrition. And so that's why I don't ever discredit the fundamentals. And I mm. love teaching it, even though you, you might think that you know it, um, doing it from the perspective of not a weight loss first approach is really yes. important. So um, I do a lot of that in the group program. And obviously I'm only one person, so I can only take a small amount of one-on-one coaching yes. clients per yes. year. Um, but if you just go to my website, which is just www.angelaclark.com.au, just my name, um, and there is an inquiry there that if you are looking for one-on-one coaching, you can just send me um, a direct message. Otherwise, there is a, a wait list for Finding Your Wings program, which yeah. is a six-week online program you can do from wherever you are in the country, in the world. Um, and it is run twice a year. So the, the doors open twice a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'll obviously finished for this year, moving on to next year. Um, you know, 2023 is the intake for that. So pop your name on the wait list and you'll be updated with all of the info about that. And just really just follow me on social. So Instagram, yeah. my Insta handle is at Angelique Clark underscore nutrition. And that's just for me um, to be able to give you evidence-informed knowledge around what's happening to your body, how to feel the active female, and really to 
you know, change the culture of nutrition. So please follow me on there because I really do have the intention to educate from a really beautiful lens from that aspect. Yeah, beautiful. A woo-woo plus science lens, the best lens (laughs) ever. (laughs) We should should name that woo and so something. Anyway. um, (laughs) I like the angle. (laughs) um, I... One of the things that I really changed when I decided that I wasn't going to go on a diet anymore, and actually there's an uh, an episode that comes out today on the podcast, which is with um, an eating disorders recovery psychotherapist that I worked with because I really knew that my attitude to all of this was very remiss. Um, but one of the things that we talk about and one that I will remind people of is that for you to change the way that you relate to your body and that you know worth equals how much you weigh and flip the narrative like we have talked about and value yourself and fuel yourself one of the key things that I would invite people to do is start swimming in a different ocean so when you're on social media unfollow any freaking account that says you need to starve yourself or do intense cardio to keep yourself in a particular size six dress and start following people like Ange that actually have evidence-based informed Um, female specific nutrition advice Um, and you offer so much great content like you've always got recipes you've got different you know um, webinars to tap into and things so yeah really encourage people to join your bubble because it's a pretty lovely nice ocean to be swimming in after years of yeah not not being well uh resourced or adjusted in terms of yeah food and weight so Thank you for sharing your beautiful beaming smile. I always love looking at your smile. You're always smiling. Um, and, yeah, just truth talking and status quo challenging of what has been an industry that's been incredibly damaging to women for many, 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 many decades. And, um, yeah, here's to valuing ourselves for way more than, yes, just the way we look, fueling ourselves, taking care of ourselves. And, yes, thank you for sharing your expertise and your woo <laughs> with us. Oh, thank you so much, Kylie. Thank you for your support. I think in my journey and my mission as well, I think it's so beautiful to be connecting with like-minded people trying to change the world. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. (laughs) Amen. Woman. Woman. Yeah, I I know. I don't know why I keep on saying amen so much. I could tell a really bad story about what I did. Yeah, I won't do that. I'm just, I will, a very quick story. I won't go into details because my kids would not forgive me, but... We once found ourselves in a very proper um, religious school interview for one of my children to get into this particular school and me being me, not thinking before I open my mouth, say something, hold up my hand and do the amen, sister, and my entire <laughs> family turns around to me and goes, what the fuck, mom? Not <laughs> so like with them. I'm like, Okay, and my uh, my hand just goes down to my lap, and I scoot myself out the door, and I'm like, "Oh, that is just a golden Kylie moment." So yes, I need to stop the amen, but yes, a woman. <laughs> That's you and your authentic power. So no, I think just keep it as is. <laughs> oh dear. All right, my love. love thank it. you so much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Hello, beautiful. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm just here to celebrate the fact that we have just clicked over 1,000 downloads of this beautiful podcast baby of mine. So funny to think because it's 55 days or 56 days today since I actually had the idea and thought, yeah, yeah, I'm going to create that and I'm going to share stories and hopefully women will really resonate with all the messages. And You have resonated, you've taken the time to pop in reviews and messages and DMs to me just to say how inspirational all of these guest stories have been and I'm so, so grateful that you're tuning in. And I'm just wondering if, like me, as we draw to the close of 2022, you're starting to realise that you are quite freaking tired. (laughs) There's been a lot going on, right, on a global scale in our communities, um, breaking down of big structures in our society and, and conditioned belief systems or shared belief systems. And for a lot of people that I know, me included, a lot of stuff going on in personal lives, a lot of taxing, stretching stuff. And the thing is that I hear all the time that we've been taught that we need to keep pushing through. You know, we need to push through to get anywhere. We need to push through the tiredness or the exhaustion. 
But I'm here to actually offer a different point of view. What if the reverse is actually true? What if the very thing we actually need most to settle our nervous systems, to help our bodies feel safe and our minds to be calm, is actually to rest more? Rather revolutionary, isn't it? I've decided as a gift from me to you for the end of 2022 and as we cross over the threshold into a brand new year to gift you a beautiful experience called Revolutionary Rest. Revolutionary Rest is a deeply relaxing and restorative yoga nidra experience that combines body and breath to come into stillness and just to be. And it provides a beautiful respite from all the stress and the busyness and the obligation you might be feeling through the silly season. And I just really, really want you to be able to be gentle with yourselves. Be gentle. Remember that you are a precious, precious, miraculous being and you need to be taken care of as well. So you will find Revolutionary Rest completely free um, on the podcast website at kyliepatchett.com.au. I really, really hope you enjoy it. I've just listened back to it myself and as much as it is a little bit weird to do a meditation to your own voice, it is really beautifully relaxing and it actually is including a few of the tips that I learned in my last week's training and next weekend coming Um, I've just been joining uh, a beautiful lady in Ireland called Neve Daly and she has a form of yoga called Instinct Yoga and the the qualification that I'm doing is all about yoga to support the stages of menopause including perimenopause and menopause and beyond. And one of the big things that we've talked about is that a key for supporting ourselves in our physical, emotional, mental spiritual health everything is to come to stillness and rest so much more than what we do so i hope you'll take me up on my offer as a gift from me to you merry christmas if you celebrate and happy new year if you're listening to this in january have a beautiful beautiful day thanks guys bye